Well, good morning. Are you ready? We're ready. That was pretty good. That was really good. That was the best you've done in a while. Yeah. Maybe Tracy really did get you guys wound up last week. I <laughs> uh, appreciate all the kind words you sent. Uh, stand and worship with us. Some smart aleck asked me if I had any more friends, though. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> I heard it, Daniel. It doesn't work without these on. I mean, it does. Ezekiel 33. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, speak to your people and say to them, if I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman. And if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword and coming, sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require 
at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning from me. I've got to switch guitars here, and I did not plan that in this. That's okay. song, so sing along with us, okay? Pray for it, Julie. <laughs> you want me really to? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you now, Lord, just give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to come and worship you, Lord. We are blessed beyond measure, and we thank you for all your blessings. Be with us now, Lord, as we um, lead worship and let these words, Lord, uh, lift your lift your our voices up to you, Lord. And it's in your precious Son, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. For my next stunt. <laughs> oh, boy. That was good. Yes, he's my son. <laughs> that was good. Dying for 
heaven short, my song shall praise Him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see Him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding for sinners please. Precious Redeemer, seems now I see Him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. Let's pray. Father, you are the blessed Redeemer. And we should love you for that more than we can imagine. Forgive us where we have failed you in that. Please do guide us. We pray that your name would be lifted high right now, today, and throughout the week in our lives. We know that if we do that, men will be drawn unto you. May that happen here, in Jesus' name. You can be seated. For those of you who don't know me, I know there's been some new faces here. I've met some that have been here a few times today and uh, hadn't met yet. But uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Chris. I'm the Worship Connections and Tech Pastor here. And uh, we're happy to have you. And uh, so... What we're about has to do with these three pillars here. Worship, corporate worship is what we're doing now. We're worshiping together. We get to do that after we worship throughout the week in our, in our personal worship and in our life groups and as we do life with other people and as we live out the life of Christ. It, that is our spiritual act of worship. And we're, uh, but we get to come in and, and enjoy that after the week on Sunday or at the beginning of the week, however you want to look at it, on both sides. <laughs> and uh, so right now what you're doing is worship, and we also have life groups. And life groups meet five, six days a week, if you count Sunday, the youth and the young adults, and in the fall and spring, the, the kids meet. So we have life groups on other, the other five days of the week for adults and, and, and young people, and not that they aren't, but uh, uh, younger people, and uh, so if you, if you haven't gotten into one of those, that's how we do church together, how we do life together. They're actually small groups, small church groups that meet in homes or here throughout the week. And we'd love to get you involved in one of those so you can do life together, not alone. And that's what it's all about. And then we have our servant teams. And uh, we believe that if you're a Christian, you are, you're supposed to serve. That's just as plain as it can be. You're supposed to serve somewhere, and we have a place for you no matter what physical ability you have or what spiritual ability you have. We have a place for you to take a, a gift analysis online if you'd like to take that and find out where your spiritual gifts lie, and uh, we can get you plugged in somewhere. We have uh, so many good servant teams here. Um, uh, it's one of the things that we do very well here, and we can always continue to do better uh, by mentoring and and moving new people into those servant teams as we train, uh, train you and mentor and, and that kind of thing to get people into serving the Lord well. And that's what we want to do is serve the Lord well. Um, so that's, that's what we got. All right. 
And uh, so if you have any questions, uh, John is not here today. He's on vacation, but he's, there's the life group table. Lynn is here, I believe. Uh, I think he's right back there. I see him. Oh, John's back. I told everybody you weren't going to be here. But sorry, there, there's John. He is here. Thank you. I'm good. Was Key West good? <laughs> you came back too soon from Florida. <laughs> anyway, all right. And, and so John is here. You can see him about uh, life groups. And I know somebody's already looking for you, and I told him you weren't here. So, <laughs> so and then Lynn Crabtree, uh, a servant, or see me, uh, or, or me. And uh, next week, uh, we've got a guy coming in to, to speak and to be... Uh, to possibly be our, our candidate. He is our candidate, but to possibly become pastor. So be here next week. Uh, huh? Yeah, be praying about it. Exactly. Uh, so look forward to seeing you next week and for you to meet him. Stand with us again. I know you all know this song, so I'm going to be watching. You can sing with us. <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Woo, that just makes me happy just saying it. <laughs>
God, indeed. Our next scripture comes from Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. storm or drought on the rock that does not move I will set my hope in your love O Lord and your faithfulness will prove you are steadfast steadfast by the all the starry hosts are called out by name each night. In your watchful care, I will rest secure as you lead us with your light. Was you. shout for joy I will raise my voice hallelujah to the Lamb and you are steadfast steadfast you are steadfast steadfast darkness your light was revealed in the presence of 
death, your life was affirmed. And in the absence of holiness, you are still God. And you steadfast love, Lord. You can be seated. Lord, be with Mark as he comes and gives us the word. May we receive it and use it. Your name high, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Thank you all for being here this morning. I'm glad, glad to see you. I'm having a little trouble seeing you with the light there, but I'll try. Thank you, Chris, this morning. I think you've done everything but give the sermon. If you'd like to, I, I can give you my notes. And not today. Not, <laughs> not yet, but you're, you're getting there. Thank you very much, worship team, too. And thank you all for being here. I'm thankful this morning that I'm not having to speak to you this morning while wearing a mask because since March 29th up to just last Sunday, I've been speaking out the veterans' home uh, every Sunday morning. My wife and I started that ministry with the church's support back in February of 2019. And of course, you know the story of COVID. Uh, the March, March of 2020, we had to leave there because of COVID. And uh, I was looking for ways to continue to try to minister to him. You know, I could not get into the building. And I had really made some close friends out there. The Lord did that. I will not take any credit for that whatsoever. In fact, I was amazed at how God worked through that ministry. To him goes all the glory. But... So it finally came to me June following March of 2020 when I was kept praying for all these men I knew and it came close to many of them. I decided, Lord, what can I do? So about one time a week, I started, I called the administrator of the veterans home first and I said, do you think it'd be all right if one time a week I would walk around that building and pray for the residents and employees and she was very receptive and very encouraging for me to do that. And I began to do that every week, starting in June 2020, right up to March when I returned, March of this year, returned my wife and I, March 29. But you know what? What God did, many times I would run into some employees outside just by coincidence and even some of the residents, there's some residents that live out there that are in, in what they call the apartments, and they have more freedom, and they would, were able to go outside. They really couldn't leave the facility, but they could go outside. And you know what? I got to talk to some, even some of them that were in the skilled care part were outside. I don't know how that happened. Well, God did it. I got to talk to them. I got to pray with them. It was unbelievable what God did. God is real, and, and what we're talking about this morning is being his servants, being not ashamed of the gospel. Do you know that when there is no way, God can make a way? Do you know that? Just, just try him. That, that verse of scripture, Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God unto salvation. 
Paul said that when he is writing to the Romans this letter. What does unashamed mean? Unashamed means to be bold, to be confident, to be unapologetic. Are you that way as a believer in Jesus Christ about the gospel? Why, why is that important today? Well, did you, if you were here last week and, and Tracy preached, did you catch what he said about his church? Did you hear him say that there, there's only about 50% of the people that have came back to their church uh, since COVID? They only have about 50 cents of what they had before COVID, or 50%. Did you hear him say that? Well, on a, a average nationally, most churches are down at least 30% all across our country. That, and they probably think these people are never coming back is what they think. I, I heard a man this week uh, on the radio, his name's Kirby Anderson, he's, he's an author and a speaker, and he's very well known in the state of Texas. He said that he's, the last week or so, he's had a missionary from Hungary visiting him, visiting, staying with him, I believe. And he said, this missionary said, I want you to know, Kirby, that in Hungary, the, the church is growing. The, the gospel is spreading. We are in Hungary. We're going toward the light, he said. But he said, I want to tell you something. He said, in America, I don't see that. He said, I've been here a few days, and i tell you what I see in the United States of America. He said, I see you going toward darkness. And it concerns me. And it, and it, breaks, it breaks my heart. Dr. David Jeremiah, I'm sure some of you have been in the small, small groups, have maybe done some of his, his studies. He just said recently, he said, he said that the Bible talks about a great falling away before the time that Jesus returns to this earth. And he said, I want to tell you all that I believe we're in that point in, in, in history. And he referred to 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3 uh, to reference when Paul wrote, Paul wrote to Timothy about what it would be like before the time that Christ came back. Do I, well, we, we know that the Bible clearly does not, that the Bible clearly teaches us that we cannot know when Jesus is going to come back. But I can tell you this, for nine years, I've been part of a group of men who on Sunday, Sunday a afternoon, they... We sat out in a parking lot on Main Street in Anna and with a sign that says free prayer. I know that really seems strange, but that's what we believe God has called us to do. And we've done it for nine years. But I'll tell you something. Within about the last nine months, we've had almost no one stop for prayer. Of all the time that we've done that, it's never been like it is right now. You know, I don't know why that is, but it's a sign to me that we as Christians need to become very serious about our faith and become unashamed about the gospel. In, in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, here's what Paul describes himself as, a bondservant. Do you know what, in the Greek, there's a word, it's doulos. Doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. That's the word that Paul actually used when he described himself as a bondservant. Do you know what that means? Well, it has reference to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 through 17, where, where it talks about a bondservant. It's, it's a slave. It was a person who put themselves in servitude for six years because they had, they had maybe lost their land, they had lost their money, and to survive, you could do that. You could become a slave to some family, and they would take care of you and provide for you. And that's the way Paul describes, describes himself, as a slave, as a slave to Christ. Why, why would he do that? Well, he... He recognized what Christ had done for him. Paul was a persecutor of the church. The Bible describes him as a great persecutor of the church. And, and he was going around arresting Christians and trying to stop the spread of the gospel. But God, 
but the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him and he had a dramatic conversion. And Paul recognized how much God loved him and he had a great transformation in, uh, in his life. And he became a servant. That doulos was... When, when that person completed six years in servitude, they were allowed to be released. If you look at Deuteronomy chap, uh, chapter 15, it talks about that. But if they loved their master, if their master took care of them and looked after them and loved them, they could decide to stay, to stay with that, that family, to be a slave forever. And what they did was they would take an awl, A-W-L, and pierce that person, either man or woman's ear, and that would be a sign that that person, man or woman, belonged to that family forever. And that's what doulos means. Paul was a slave to Christ. He gave himself to Christ the rest of his life. And also he describes himself, he says, he said he's called as an apostle. Paul recognized that he was called, that God had a mission for him. Paul, Paul, Paul was the missionary to the Gentiles. He was ta to take the word to the Gentile people. He knew God had, had called him to do that. And God has a call on each one of our lives. Do you, do you realize that? He has a plan he has a plan for, for each of us to serve him in some certain way. I read, uh, as I was reading some material and commentary on this scripture, uh, a minister wrote about a man that he, was his good friend. And he, and he was a professor at a college, an English professor. And he left his job as an English professor to be a mailman. Now, this pastor couldn't understand. I'm not mentioning his name because I have some differences with this man now because he's, he's kind of become woke. He's kind of departed. Thank you. My mouth is getting a little dry. He's kind of departed from a lot, lot of the truth that the scriptures teaches. So I won't mention his name. Thank you, Jonathan. But this is, this is a good illustration. He couldn't figure out why in the world... His friend would leave such a, a good position to become a mailman until he explained to him why he did that. And he, he said, I was so dumbfounded when he explained it to me. The only way I could reply to him was this. He said, well, you just be the best mailman you can then. He said, well, you know, I'm not. He said, I'm always the last one to always get back. And now I cannot sleep at night. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I never realized there were so many lonely people. So many people that have no one to talk to. No one to share things with. And then he said, how do you think you would sleep if you, if you drank 15 cups of coffee every day? But this pastor said, here's what he said. He said, I realized this man found, found his calling in life. He had a purpose in life. He was excited about life now. He found what God had for him. So that's what Paul, Paul was. That's why he could endure all the different things that he went through and keep going on. The man was beaten. The man was stoned. The man was drug out of cities. The man was thrown out of cities. He spent two years in Caesarea and house arrest. Two years in Rome and house arrest and released and ended up, ended up back in Rome. And in prison again, and in a dungeon this time, until they, they either beheaded him or killed him in some way. But he was called, and he was faithful to that call. Well, also, it says in verse 7, Paul is writing to the Romans. He wrote this letter before he went to Rome. And he, taught, he called them called as saints. You know, when you hear the word saints, don't you think, well, that's, some, that's a Christian that's dead. Someone that's, that's passed away, that's no longer living. No, it's really not. If you've received Jesus Christ into your life, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit resides in you, you are a saint. Did you know that? You know what saint means? Actually means, it means holy. It means set apart. Now, that, that can be in position... Remember when Moses 
appeared before the burning bush. God said to him, you're on holy ground. God called that ground holy. Why? What was it, what was it, how was it different than any other ground there? Because God set it apart as holy. The utensils they, they used in the temple, they were considered holy. All the things that they used in the worship in the temple, they were, why? Why were they different than any other instrument? Because they were set apart by God. You've been set apart by God if you're a born believer. He, he looks at you as holy, but... Not only in position, but also, though, in able to fulfill his call on your life, it, you, it has to come out in your life in practice. Are you practicing your calling as a saint as you go through, through life? Well, Paul begins in verse, verse 9. He talks about what are three ways. What can we, if our nation is falling into darkness like this man told Kirby Anderson. If that's true, what can we do? We as bond servants of Christ, we as called to some kind of purpose in our life, saints, holy, set apart from God, what can we do? Well, I believe that we can be unashamed to pray, unashamed to use the gift that God has given us in service of Him, and lastly, unashamed, we all have, are in a place of influence somewhere. Even as we go about our daily lives, are you being an influence of, for Christ wherever you are? Are you not ashamed of the gospel? Well, let's start with prayer. Paul says in verse 9, For, for God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel... Of his son is my witness is how unceasingly, listen, to that, unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayers. Making requests if perhaps now at last by the will of God I make, make, may succeed in coming to you. Unceasingly, always. Are you that kind of person in prayer? How did Paul get to be like that? If you look at all his epistles or letters, I'll use the word, the letters that Paul wrote in the Bible. This is one of them, Romans. You will see in almost every letter he talks about that he's praying for these people. He almost always starts that way. Where did he learn how that prayer was so important? Well, if you remember the story in Acts, and I won't say story, forgive me. The account. Because these aren't stories in the Bible. Do you know that? This is the truth. These aren't stories. It's the truth. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul was going to Damascus to arrest the Christians, Jesus Christ appeared to him as a, a blinding light and spoke to him, Paul, Paul, why are you pers persecuting me? Well, it says that Paul made his way into Damascus and he was blind. That he was blind for three days and three nights. And you know what the Bible says? He did not eat any food or drink anything for three days and three nights. Now, if you don't think that's difficult, try it. But he was so overwhelmed with what happened to him that he, I think he was praying. I think he was trying to converse with God. You know, what's going on? What are you trying to communicate? He thought he was doing God's work at that time. He wasn't. God sends a man by the name of Ananias. Go to Paul. I want what Tracy said last week about Jesus. He said, you know, Jesus didn't do a lot of things, but one thing he did do was Jesus prayed. You, all through the script, this was the Son of God. This was God, 100% God man and 100% flesh man. But he still had to go. Sometimes the Bible says he spent all night in prayer. There was a, a Scottish preacher, Oswald Chambers, a man that I've read some of his works. He died at the age of 45. He was a chaplain among the British soldiers in World War I. Here's one thing he wrote. He said, you know, it's not do... And this is in Scottish uh, English, I guess you would say. He said, it's not do, do, and you'll be with the Lord, but it's be, be, and I'll do through you. These men understood the importance of prayer. If you're not in sync with God, He can't use you. And prayer is the place. Prayer, reading your scriptures, honestly, 
communicating with the Lord, that is where God is going to get you in a position where He can really use you. Well, I can... And that's the way Paul was. That's why he's always talking about prayer. That's why he starts here in Romans. Unceasingly, always praying for you. When I was 11 years old, here's what God... And why, if you know me, I'm a praying person. Like I said, I sit out on the street... If you don't think that's hard, come and do it with us sometimes. Sit on the main street on Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. I will walk around the church and walk around the veterans' home and pray. I, try to, I haven't been as faithful as I like to be walking just around town praying. When I was 11 years old, I had a terrible accident. And I cut an artery in two and nicked another artery. Lost a tremendous amount of blood. No doctor at Union County emergency room. And nurse kept calling all over. There was a doctor on call and he never did show up. She kept calling all over trying to get a doctor. But that woman, <clears throat> she had a phone. There was a phone in the emergency room. She was holding her phone. She turned to me and looked to me and said three words. And I was scared to death up to that point. She said three words. Have you prayed? And right through that, at 11-year-old boy, God got my attention. Because you know why? I hadn't even thought about God. All I thought about was, what's going to happen to me? I was scared to death. I thought, I'm leaving. And I didn't know where I was going. That woman... Called by God, a bond servant, unashamed to say to a boy, "Have you prayed?" I know, and she wouldn't have said that if she hadn't been, if she hadn't been praying. She wouldn't have said that. See, God already at eleven years old starting to prepare me for the plan He had for my life. We're called. We're called. How has God been calling you? Have, you? have you been listening? How about when I was a senior in high school? A woman in our church. I'll, I'll tell her. Tell your name. Her, her name was. Barbara Thornmorton. She had lost her husband. Who was in the Air Force. He was in training for the astronaut program. And he was killed. She had a very young son at that time. But she was a strong believer. She also was battling cancer at that time too. But she, she took an active part in working with the young people of our church. She gave me a book that said, and I remember it to this day, <clears throat> Prayer Conversing with God for the under 21 crowd, I think it said on. You know, I read that book, and that book had a great influence on me. Again, here's a person that was unashamed, gone through terrible tragedies in her own life, but unashamed, had a call from God, and she gave me a book. And, there, and that, that began to change my life. I was a letter carrier. I hadn't been one too young. Know, too many years. I was on over on Grand Avenue here in Anna. Came up to a lady's house with her mail. And she came, came out on the porch. I talked to her before. And maybe I'd said something about the Lord before. I don't remember exactly. She said to me, I'm going to the eye doctor tomorrow. They told me I'm losing my sight. She was pretty frantic. She said, can you pray for me? Well, I didn't pray for... Now, if anyone knows me, in those years following that, I prayed with people out on the mail route all the time. She said, can you pray for me? She was scared to death. Which, wouldn't you be? If you're about to lose your sight? Think about it a minute. About two days later, I came by her house. She came out and said to me, she said... Thank you for praying. My eyes are healed. Well, I was shocked because I couldn't remember if I honestly even prayed or not. Honestly. But I'll tell you what happened that day. Again, God got my attention. And let me tell you, never again 
that anyone asked me to pray for them that I did not do it. And pretty well, almost all the time anymore, I would do it right then. You see how, God, even as I was preparing this message, you see how God works in our lives to equip us, to repair us. To, to, he has a calling on, on, on all of our lives and a purpose. Well, why would we be ashamed to pray? Well, there's a scripture in Acts chapter 12. Maybe you remember this, this account. Herod had killed the disciple or apostle, James. And he saw how that pleased the Jews. So he had Peter arrested. Well, the church at that time, you know what they did? They got together and prayed. And it says, let me just read you a few verses of Acts chapter 12. After Peter had been released miraculously, God sent an angel. And, when he, and Peter, he, he thought it was all a dream at first. It wasn't even real. He couldn't believe it. But then he realized it was real. In verse 12, Acts 12, 12. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark. This is where they were praying, in this house. Where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked on the door, he went up and knocked on the door at the gate. A servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate. But ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. <laughs> they, so she, she went to these people and told them, told them this. They, and you know what they said? Verse 15, they said to her, you are out of your mind. Now, can you imagine people who had gathered together to pray for Peter, for, for God to do something, when God did a miracle and the, uh, the servant girl came and told them, they said, well, you're out of your mind. They could, you know, why would they respond in such a way? Well, maybe they had gathered together to pray for James and look what happened to James. He died. You know, they weren't expecting a whole lot. They were just probably expecting that maybe God would spare Peter's life. But they didn't, they couldn't believe that he, that God did them right. You know, sometimes God answers in that way. Not always. But sometimes he did. But, the, you know, I can see how people get discouraged. How We've almost, I think, come to a point anymore that if there's something tragic happening, we don't even call the church to come together to pray anymore. Are there, any, there aren't very many churches that ha have just a prayer meeting anymore, are they? Because you know why? I believe you look at Acts chapter 12. Well, God just didn't answer, hasn't been answering the way we thought he had answer. And so we kind of just lose, well, those prayers must not make any difference. What is it to be unashamed of prayer? I had a friend years ago who got a brain tumor. He was really an encouragement to me. He was in a sensual class I had. It was very encouraging. And he, I, I would go and sometimes pray with him because I had a burden. He, he it was bad. And he said to me, Mark, would you just pray that I would live long enough to see my daughter graduate from college? And it kind of struck me back because his daughter was still in high school at that time. But I started praying that. I started praying that. And I kept calling him and I kept going to see him. And he got really bad. I mean, he was dying. So what do you do? You've, you've had this friend. You've went and you've prayed with him. You've prayed with him on the phone. You've talked to his wife. No, I never, you know, I didn't know what God was going to do. I, but I kept praying. Well, you know what? You know, you almost think, well, well I need just to shrink back and get up, go under a rock somewhere. But you know what, I, what God called me to do? To go see him in the hospital. When nothing was working out like we expected or hoped for or prayed for. 
So I stood out at that hospital and I said, Lord, you know this is tough. I said, it says in your word, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. May I be that person. So I went up there. And he, it was rough. He was doing this and this and this. I could tell he's in terrible pain. It was tough. And I said to him, it came to my mind, I think, what he had done when we, a bunch of men, went to Washington, D.C. in 1997, when they had the stand in the gap. Maybe some of you remember that. Promise Keepers did that. There was about a million men that came to Washington, D.C. during that time. He's the one, when I, this is before he got ill, I brought that up in our Senate class, and he, he's the one that went ahead and started chartering buses, and he got all this set up so we could go. So God brought that to my mind, and I started telling him, I said, you know, if it hadn't been for you, and there was two buses that went for Anna. I said, if it hadn't been for you, we would have never gone. And you know what? The biggest smile came across his face. And peace, peace seemed to come into that room. Unashamed to pray, God, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the God. We can't be ashamed. We've got to have hope no matter what it looks like. Because God is bigger than that. Never, never forget that. God is bigger than our circumstances. And Paul knew that. He was unashamed. We've got to be the same way. Especially during, no matter how bleak it looks. No matter how bad it gets. Keep going, keep praying, keep telling people. Because it's the power of God unto salvation. God's power is bigger than anything that any of us are ever going to experience. I'm not saying it might not be hard, because it could be. It was hard for this man. I saw him suffering terribly. I, he did not get to see his daughter graduate, even from high school. But I saw God bring peace to him in the midst of everything that was happening to him. Because it's the power of God in salvation. Let me... Is Brad, is it 11 o'clock? Is that right? Is that right? I'm, I'm okay, my watch, this watch stops. My, my normal watch uh, broke the band on yesterday. So this watch sometimes stops. So I don't want to try to go over. Thank you. You're good. Thank you. I told you I was going to bring you into this. All right, let's go on here. What is another way we should be unashamed of the gospel? Is God has given each of us a gift. We talk about this, you know, servant teams. We've all got some kind of gift. My gift is mercy. It's not teaching. It's not preaching. It's mercy. I will sometimes be merciful and stand up and preach and teach sometimes. And I've done that. Colin knows, don't you, Colin? He says, look at verse 11. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you. Each of us by, each of us by the other's faith, both Yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may attain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. Paul wanted to impart his gifts. Paul had the gifts of teaching. He had the gifts of encouragement. And he went around doing that. He established churches all over that area and went all the way to Spain. They believed that he... Before the, he was, after he was arrested and released from Rome, that he went all the way to Spain and he preached the gospel, got the, the, got the gospel there, encouraging, teaching. He had that gift. Even in Acts chapter 27, when Paul was first making his way to Rome and on, was on a ship, they got, they got into a terrible storm. 
And Paul knew that, you know, he knew, well, first he tried to warn them before they went. He tried to warn the Roman soldiers that were with him, the ship's captain, don't go. Paul knew. God had revealed to him. He says, men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Paul warned them. He, he had this ability, but they didn't listen to him at this time. They just blew him off. Well, that's that preacher. We're not going to listen to him. Well, they did get in a terrible storm for days, and they thought everything was lost. And let me read verse 21 in Acts chapter 27. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice. And not, to, and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage. Here he is using his gift to encourage them. When it looked like all was lost. For there will be no loss of life among you but only of the ship. Well how did he know that? Look at verse 23. For this very night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me saying... Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God. There, there's that word again, courage. See, he's an encourager. Even when it looked like all was lost. Anybody had any sense at all, they knew it was all over. I mean, it, the things were that bad. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God. I believe God. He was unashamed to speak what God had told him to speak, even though it didn't look like it at all. Unashamed. I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on a certain island. And then let me skip over in verse 34 again. Listen to him. Therefore I encourage you to take some food. For this is for your uh, preservation. For not a hair from your head will perish. Even in such a terrible, terrible situation. He's encouraging. He's saying what God said. Even though it didn't look. To, un, are you like that? Can we be like that? It's tough. Isn't it? When it looks like all hope is gone. Can we believe what God says. And have hope. You know. Jesus told Martha and Mary. When Lazarus had died. He who believes in me. Shall never die. Do you believe that as a believer? Do you really believe that? That we don't need to fear death. I mean, this COVID thing, back when it first started, all this stuff, you know, you're hearing all this stuff. There's a few nights I laid in bed, and I, fear, did any, any of you like that? Fear kind of began to come over me. But, you know, we don't need, death, death is separation from God. Like Tony used to say, you know, to say goodbye here, then immediately the next thing we're doing is saying hello in heaven. Do you believe, do we really believe it? Do we live like we really believe it? We who are believers in Jesus Christ are never going to die. You're just going to go from one place to another. Don't forget that. Using your gifts. When I was about, I guess, I'm thinking about Bryce Lingo, about his age. A pastor of our church came to me once and said this. He said, you need to learn how to go to the nursing homes. <laughs> he said, you need to learn the mystery of the nursing home. And you know what I was thinking in my head? What in the world are you talking about? Go to the nursing homes. I wouldn't be caught dead in a nursing home. I, I'm scared of the nursing homes. I thought, but for whatever reason, and I don't know exactly why, I don't know how God dealt with me. I went. We went to Union County Nursing Home here in Anna and visiting with a lady and the pastor said to me he said to her he said mark and i are now going to sing to you in the garden <laughs> and i thought you know what not only can i not sing at all and i can't i have no idea how in the garden goes and here he starts up and i'm just sitting there it was embarrassing but he visited with her and talked with her you know and here i am you know and then we go to a lady's house over in Highmore Street. And Annie says, before we go in, he says this to me. 
Now, she loves to talk about her trip to California, so just sit there and listen, you know, be nice and listen. And sure enough, we went in there and sat down, and she begins to tell about her trip to California. Uh, now, don't laugh at this because it seems funny, but it's kind of sad here. All of a sudden, I hear this snoring. I mean, not a light snoring, but a loud snoring, loud. And this woman who's telling about her trip to California, she said, am I so boring that I put him to sleep? She said that. And I thought, well, no. I said, he's been having some medical problems. I thought, well, maybe he's just testing me. He's seeing if I can talk to this woman. He's pretending to be asleep. But he kept snoring and loud for 45 minutes. He slept for four, and I said, what in the, but it turned out this man, not too long after that, this pastor, who I respected very much, he had a heart attack. He was having serious heart issues, and he struggled with that for years after that, and finally just died. I mean, I, that's why I say don't laugh, because it's really kind of sad. But he took his gift. He was trying to, like Paul said, pass it on to me, see, I mean, even in such a, I don't know, what you, unprecedented way. I mean, he slept through as I, it's, but, but what does that show you? It shows you that no matter how imperfect you might be or un, 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 untalented un, un you might be, or God can still use you because look at me today. What am I doing? I'm ministering in a, see, nursing home God was calling me way back then and I can tell some other stories about visits I made to nursing home Paul wanted to impart gifts to the people of Rome we can do the same thing are you unashamed even though you might fall asleep when you're trying to teach someone something don't be unashamed of the gift be unashamed of the gift be bold be confident be unapologetic. Use what God's given you to serve Him. Lastly, real quick, Paul says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed. There it is right there. I am not ashamed. I hope you know that verse. If you don't know it, learn it. Say it to yourself when you get discouraged or when you think you can't do, do something. For I am unashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was unashamed. Do you know when, before he went, got on that ship and they went through that terrible storm, do you know that in Acts chapter 26, let's see if I can find it, or 20, let's see. Paul was on, he was, first he was under uh, Fest, uh, Felix and then Fest, uh, these were governors of Caesarea when he was under house arrest. And before he went to Rome, Festus had him before King Agrippa and they were wanting him, Festus was trying to get some charge that he could send with Paul to Rome. They really had no evidence that he had done anything wrong, even though they had him arrested, even though the Jewish leaders had had him arrested. In fact, they arrested him to save his life. But you know what he does when he's on trial? Does he try to defend himself? Does he try to get off? Here's what he's, he, he's try, what he does is share his testimony. He shares what God has done for him. He says, verse 22 of Acts chapter 26 so having attained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both the small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. That Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Okay, he's preaching the gospel instead of trying to say, oh, well, I'm not guilty. He's trying to bring more to Christ, unashamed of the gospel. Verse 24, for while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. That's the response he got from Festus. Remember what they said to the poor girl? He said, Peter's right out here. Quit praying. He's right out here at the door. You're out of your mind. Paul, you're out of your mind. 
that your great learning has driven you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. And he did, unashamed of the gospel. But you know what King Agrippa said? The last thing he said, Agrippa replied in verse 28, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. He's getting to King Agrippa by just sharing his testimony. Testimony. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short time or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for this change. That's what Paul was about. Bringing people to Christ. He ended up losing his life because of it. He was so committed. He was called. He was a bondservant, a slave. How about us? I said to my son, Jonathan, I'm going to bring you into this, Jonathan. (laughs) I didn't ask him. I told Chris I was going to ask him. I didn't. But I said to him, Jonathan, what would you do if you were in a college class? And the professor got up there and on the board, he wrote God at the very top, top. And then he wrote Jesus. And then he might have written the Holy Spirit. Then he starts with the angels, Michael and Gabriel. and just Then he draws a line and gets down on the floor. On the floor and right just above the floor there, he writes man down. And he says, how in the world can we ever expect God to ever hear us or ever have any access to, to him at all if we have to go through all these people to get to God? And he was cynical. And I could tell he hated God. Well, (laughs) I haven't always in my life, to my shame, but to that one time I spoke up and said, that's not right. I said, you see what you've got there, second, Jesus Christ? I said, you know, it's through him that we have direct access to the Father unashamed of the gospel can you can you at those times speak up you know Paul said the Greeks to to barbarians or the Greeks you know to those that are wise to those that are foolish you know sometimes it's easier for us to reach out to the less fortunate in this but when it comes to those that are at the very top or those that are over us how good a job are we doing being unashamed of the gospel. It's intimidating, isn't it? Especially in our culture today. You're going to be canceled. You know it? It's happening in Canada. There's pastors that have got on the radio and talked about things like marriage. And they're in jail now. Did you know that? Unashamed. Unashamed. Jan, on, when I delivered meals, Jan and Jim, when I delivered meals Thursday, every person I went to, every person I went to, I said to, do you know how to get to heaven? I just, if I'm going to preach it, I need to practice it. And I had some interesting conversations, even got to pray with some people, which I do a lot when I'm out there delivering those meals on Thursday. Do you know that the people you're around, do you know whether or not they know the Lord or not? And I was surprised that many of them said yes, that they knew that Jesus was the way, but not all of them did. And I tried to tell them. Paul was like that. He was looking, even when he was on trial, he was looking for ways to share the gospel. I pray that as you leave here today, that you will think about being unashamed of the gospel. Wherever God leads you to be unashamed, and in unashamed in prayer, unashamed to use the gift that God has given you to bring others up along. Next week, we're going to have a man here that is a candidate to be pastor here. And he's going to bring his gift, the gift that God has given him to you. But what do you have to give to him and his wife? I appreciate your attention has been very wonderful. You know, sometimes the veterans on some of them go to sleep. But you know what's great about that? They'll come and apologize to me. 
It didn't used to be like that, but now God has done such a work out there. If they fall, and they do, they're under medication, they're in wheelchairs. We have no idea all they're going through. And they'll come, I'm sorry I went to sleep. And it breaks my heart that they're so, you know, so into it. You've been in, into it, this message today. I appreciate it. Be that way next week because it makes a difference to the one that's up here. Encourage him. Encourage his wife. You have a gift to give to them. We, are we still doing the... All right. As we close here this morning, if you need prayer today, we will have s some people over here to pray with you or any... If you're, if you're an elder, if you're a trustee, if you're a life group leader, if you can raise your hand, these people are here to pray for you today. I'm, thank you, thank you guys, thank you. I'm here to always to pray. That's what, you know, God's called me to do. I pray for people. And we're willing to pray for you. So let me turn it back over to you, Chris. And, Stand with us. Some of, you, some of the prayer team, go ahead and come forward. and That way they can see you up here and, and come to you. Thank you, Mark. because of this testimony and song that we need to be vigilant in telling others because of what happened in our lives. I 
full of rocks and heart made of stone. The streets are moving. And that your touch, my sleeping spirit, was awakened. On my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Every citizen by grace and grace alone. So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Amen. Let's pray. Let's go out and live like we do believe it. Lord, we're grateful and thankful for the, for the word today that given to us. Use it. Work through us with your Holy Spirit. Show us the opportunities that we know are there. Give us those and give us clear minds and thoughts when you do. In Jesus' name, amen.